Wow, amazing! Right? This country is pumped to the max in many aspects, from national security to safety and skiing, from the alpine atmosphere to the alpine free ride, from incredible infrastructural solutions and public transport to incredibly high prices for almost everything. In this video, we'll deal with these aspects on the example of one very picturesque ants elite region. Enhadinia is a mountainous region near the border with Italy, which, like most of the Alps, is famous for its lakes and mountain landscapes, and in addition to them, it's also famous for St. Moritz. Generally recognized as the most expensive and elitist city, not the cheapest in all of Switzerland, and accordingly one of such in the whole world. It has an astonishingly high concentration of hardcore luxury and glamour, and the tradition of winter sports. We'll talk about this a bit later. Let's start not from the city itself, but from its main natural gem, the great, beautiful, and eponymous lake. By area, it's not the largest in the valley, but definitely the richest in all kinds of events. For instance, in summer, there is a local yacht club. Of course, there is one here, arranging real yacht races. In the off-season, there is just a wonderful route for walks. And when the water freezes enough, this is followed by special state institutions. By the way, here, you can watch an event no less elitist than yachting regattas. Annually, since 1911, horse races and horse polo tournaments are held here. This event is called White Covering, and it will gather spectators among ordinary people as well as among owners of gold VIP memberships for more than 10,000 francs. Athletes and spectators fly in their private planes and fur coats, drink champagne, and watch this wonderful sport. Perhaps this best characterizes St. Moritz. The official population of the city is around 5,000 people, and it's mostly either those who were lucky enough to inherit property here or very, very wealthy people, including Russian oligarchs on whom Switzerland supposedly imposed sanctions. But due to their traditional banking secrecy, it's impossible to find out from open sources what exactly happened to their states. And somewhere on the upper levels of the San Moritz slopes is the most expensive villa in Switzerland, and one of such in the world. In 2018, it was on sale for 185 million euros, and from the outside, the estate looks, well, not that it's all about the money, but the fact is that there are equal parts, some which go under the alpine lands, and the main thing, rich swings in this castle, besides private access to elevators and bathrooms in an actual underground lake. In general, digging or drilling something underground or in rocks is like a national Swiss tradition. They began creating extensive railway tunnels as early as the 18th century and still stand as one of the world's flagships in this field. It's expected that the longest and deepest railway tunnel is located in this country, approximately 50.7 kilometers under the Alps. During the period between the First and Second World Wars, they began creating an entire network of defensive bunkers, so that in case someone decides to encroach on Swiss lands, they'll meet the invader with the ground and guns hiding there. And these were not just small shelters, but enormous autonomous multi-kilometer networks carefully camouflaged in the mountains. So, while other countries were making alliances, the Swiss were digging alpine soil to have a foundation, a pun for their famous neutrality. Of course, I can't help but mention that after World War II, the Swiss didn't dig as many bunkers throughout the country that could secure the entire population in case of a nuclear strike. In short, underground Switzerland is no less interesting than the Switzerland we usually see. I only spent one and a half days in the city, and it seemed extremely inconvenient for hiking, except for specially marked paths. Its narrow streets are only suitable for hopping out of your Range Rover to a restaurant or something. 
The concentration of high fashion establishments here is probably the highest I've ever seen, which is basically quite expected. A Rolls Royce didn't let me shoot the video. Winter events of the film House Gucci were filmed somewhere around here in San Maurice, but they were actually shot in a slightly more budget-friendly resort somewhere in Italy. Probably the official version is to not draw much attention to the filming, but the actual reason might be simply a lack of funds to resettle everyone. Occasionally, you can find some inexpensive offers, but the average price for a night during the winter season enters the top of the most expensive cities in the world. One of the local luxury hotels has become very iconic for all of the Alps in general. If the French town Chamonix became the birthplace of mountaineering, then in San Moritz and practically in this very hotel, winter recreation in the form we know began. In one summer around the mid-19th century, its owner made a bet with his English guests that if they came here in winter, they'd enjoy it as much as in the warm season when they visited. They came and stayed until spring. Since then, San Moritz started receiving wealthy travelers all year round and effectively became the first winter resort and began to be rebuilt for tourism purposes. And hotels with villas became new historical appearances. There are very few old buildings left in the city. It was all converted into hotels and new shops. Even now, you can hear the construction noise in the background. And this is one of the few such medieval sites, and the main feature of this tower is that it is very much tilted to the side. It's like the sun reads leaning tower. From afar, it is especially clear how much this tower is tilted. There it is, sticking out. I went to a light. There is one because of the earthquake that occurred here, somewhere in the 16th century. Since then, they wanted to destroy it several times, but somehow it didn't come to that. And now the locals are against clearing it away because it's possibly the only architectural local heritage. From architectural heritage, let's move to gastronomic heritage. And I'm not talking about Swiss cheeses or even chocolate. I dropped by a local cafe with decent ratings and a single dollar sign on Google Maps to try the famous Engadine Tart, a local dessert where hazelnuts, filbert or caramelized walnuts are baked in short crust pastry. Although the actual thickness of the filling was a bit different from what I saw online, there's nothing much to be done. Let's taste it. Wow, it's really yummy. The Engadine tart is simply exquisite, bursting with rich flavors and a perfect blend of nuts and caramel. But I guess the uh, price will be a bit steep for the relatively small portion it offers. 5.5 euros, much cheaper than I expected. From something sweet, let's move on to winter sports, in which San Moritz was also one of the pioneers. Here in 1928, they held the second Winter Olympics, after Chamonix. Then in 1948, they held it again. In the entire history, there were only three such cities. And a lot of different vintage sports facilities remain here, some of which still function. The most famous and legendary of them is the bobsleigh track. Firstly, it's the oldest in the world, opened in 1904. Secondly, it's the only natural one in the world. Each year after snow falls, it's reshaped, so speed records here don't carry over from season to season as it slightly differs each time. Ordinary tourists won't be allowed on the bobsleigh track, but what you can try is the Olympic ice rink. After the glorious Olympic days, the ice rink was slightly neglected, but in 2017, the famous British Architectural Bureau, Foster & Partners, restored everything in a pleasant vintage style, and now it's a perfect location for a light romantic ice skate. In general, if it's not the ultimate alpine happiness, it's something very close to it. 
Touching this happiness with skate rentals cost 22 francs, and I decided to make this investment. Definitely the best ice rink I've been to, even a little cooler than the river under my balcony. Finally, above the city is a huge skiing area, Corvilia. I went there with a group of friends who were exploring Engadine at that time. We started from the town of Samadin, which is known for its proximity to the Engadine, and accommodation there was noticeably cheaper. But there we received the main financial blow. The ski pass at the counter cost 190 euros for two days. The most expensive lifts I've ever ridden. The lifts here, I wouldn't say they are modern. They're slightly vintage, to the extent that there are no compartments for snowboards, so we had to take it inside, where there wasn't much space. At the station, we were given a special snowboard cover so that we wouldn't scratch this beautiful new cabin. So Corvilla at first glance hardly differs from the other alpine resorts. The same 96 miles of well-groomed slopes, extraordinary photo wallpapers around, and scenic overpriced restaurants. But if you take a closer look, you'll realize that Corvilla slightly stands out from this skiing family. The advertisement stands are not about skiing, but more about target brands, and the audience around often prefers fashion to technology. For example, instead of helmets, you can notice such super safe fur hats. And the question may arise, what are you even hunting for there? The point is that this glamorous crowd is mostly not very keen on free riding. Therefore, a few days after snowfall, right near the tracks, you can find almost untouched glades. Admit it, you won't get such a bonus in any VIP ski pass. So it looks like a free ride. Let's go! Wow, such amazing snow! I loved it. Short, but wonderful. That's what she said. <laughs> I still find it hard to believe that we mostly independently explored the alpine slopes in sunny weather. Then, feeling a bit more confident, we took a short walk, searching for longer and steeper descents. And of course, these searches were successful. At that moment, it all looked like the Swiss quality standard for a day of skiing, but it didn't last long. Literally 10 minutes ago, we were riding down this slope, enjoying ourselves, going back up again when an avalanche came down, covering the whole slope. Now, I'd like to focus more on how efficiently the Swiss rescuers responded. They appeared almost instantly on the mountain, and at the base of the slope brought three helicopters by which they evacuated potential victims. They also deployed service dogs to sniff out snow for potentially buried riders. In short, the Swiss clockwork worked, and of course, they asked us to leave the slope to potentially avoid causing them more work and having any desire for it. Honestly, we didn't have any at all. Overall, the rescue operation left a very pleasant impression. We calmly rode through its trails and headed home, but the adventures didn't end there. Wanted to fly, film the road back home, and the drone just unexpectedly flipped in the air and somewhere crashed. Looks like one engine failed. 
so it should be somewhere around here. Well, according to the map, it's right below me somewhere. Here it is. It got buried. Damn. Oh my gosh, it buried itself there. I don't think it's all right, but it's not broken at least. It's good it happened in the middle of the slope and not somewhere in the city above the road. Of course, drones in general are quite unpredictable. Samadin is the administrative center of the Upper Engadin region with a population of about 3,000 residents. It felt to me almost the complete opposite of San Moritz. The city is by no means poor, but much quieter, with more historical buildings and overall less touristy and oligarchic. The main feature and highlight of Samadin is the local airport, which is the highest in Europe capable of regular flights and is considered by pilots to be somewhat challenging for landing due to its location in the mountain valley. It's also an interesting place for plane spotting or watching airplanes. Various business jets, luxury lovers, and horse-drawn carriages are often parked here. The path to the city, however, wasn't an aviation one, but a more typical Swiss path. It started with a two-hour jam at the border with Italy, not because someone was trying to smuggle cigars, but due to some technical work in the one-way tunnel, the only way into the country at that moment. When I arrived at the railway station after 9 p.m., everything was closed. But somewhere in the schedule, one last train to my destination was mentioned. So, I decided to wait for it. Therefore, an hour of meditation in the Alpine Frost and, with Swiss precision, minute by minute according to the plan, the Midlander train arrived at the platform. Swiss people travel by trains more than anyone in Europe. Only Japan surpasses them globally, which is not surprising. Firstly, despite the mountainous terrain, it's one of the most extensive and dense railway networks. Secondly, it's also one of the most punctual. Over 90% of the trains arrive on time, with Swiss punctuality defined as being less than a 3-minute deviation from the schedule. It's a very strict standard, and the Swiss railway leads Europe in quality and reliability, ranking third globally after Japan and Hong Kong. Regarding the beauty and technology of the trains and specific routes, I'll praise them a little later in this video. But for now, let's return to the evening on the road. So, arriving in Samadin, I set out to find my lodge and initially thought that Google Maps led me to somewhere wrong. However, the host met me and guided me to his attic. Oh wow, it's like, it's like a castle. <laughs> Thank you for waiting for me. Oh, look. See you tomorrow. Settled in a beautiful, authentic Alpine building. I initially thought it was a mistake because the facade stated restaurant, but it's a typical situation where one building serves as both a restaurant and living space for tourists. In my case, the rooms were located under the roof. It's not just an attic, but a complete museum of Swiss farm achievements, which I'll show now. The first items that caught my eye were the enormous cowbells, a Swiss farming tradition usually handcrafted and passed down through generations. The larger the bell size on the animal, the more significance it holds for the herd. These bells with louder sounds are easier to locate on the slopes. I read that this ornament indicates the owner's love for the animals, which is somewhat ironic as the belt for these bells is made of cowhide. Throughout the attic, you'll find various alpine cargoes such as ancient skins, agricultural equipment, crockery, and exclusively handmade wooden furniture. All extremely authentic. A 
And here I am, alone, occupying the entire floor. As for the room I live in, it's this tiny cell. It cost me around 75 francs, and by local standards, that's quite inexpensive. I was surprised that for guests in the attic, there's a shared shower and toilet on the floor, but each room has its own sink. I don't know why, but it's quite convenient. The room is quite dark because the window is very small. However, it offers a wonderful Swiss landscape view. Beyond that window, there's almost nothing happening, just eerily quiet, as if some kind of curfew hour. In Switzerland, most of the population lives in such small towns or suburbs of larger cities, and the country isn't known for any super carnival atmospheres. Locals during their free time either stay at home or are somewhere in the mountains. To be honest, I kind of like this vibe. In my four days of Samadin, the only place I visited was the restaurant on the ground floor of my accommodation. Its vibe is certainly no worse than that of the attic, and operates according to the town's most suitable rhythm. It opens in the morning and then again for a few hours in the evening. We're in the Italian part of Switzerland, so the menu is dominated by the iconic Italian dish, ravioli. It's not just pieces of pasta with filling, they're genuine culinary art. For example, I had ravioli with local ham, Greek nuts, and some alpine herbs. It was a work of art. Price 26 francs. I still remember this ravioli even now. It had quite a sharp and Swedish taste of those same herbs, which really stood out in the entire gastronomy. I wouldn't say it was worth every franc, but it was really good. Interestingly, it would be nice to chat with the owners of this establishment, Dino. Dino, he and his family have owned the estate in this ravioli tradition for several generations. Considering that I've never seen any other guests here, I was curious whether it actually pays off to feel comfortable in such an expensive region. It turns out the occupancy of the attic and the restaurant's guests in the high season is more than enough. We close in uh, spring and autumn. You're closed? Yeah, and then we go, we go traveling. Ah, around the world. So you work during the winter and during the summer, yes, during the exactly. high seasons, yeah. and then you go traveling. Yes. Yeah. And so is, is it the only source of income so to yes, afford the travels? Yeah. All right. Well, that's cool. On one of such trips, he met his future wife, who later moved here all the way from Hong Kong. This enormous metropolis seemed to be a complete opposite of this tiny alpine town. The only thing that it probably shares with Switzerland is, once again, the trains and the extremely high food prices. Switzerland, by their average cost, ranks second in the world right after Bermuda. However, Dino's wife, whose name I forgot, quickly adapted to the local vibe and rhythm, and the fact that leisure here mainly involves only mountains and lakes. She already had the rights to share as a local and told me about various interesting places, one of which we would head to in the morning. Actually, you can use a bus here. Maybe I'll take the public transportation. There's a bus stop right here with a strict timetable. Well, it's Switzerland after all, but I'll miss these buses because... Andrew arrived in his van. He's the one who brought the group with whom we were riding to Corvilia and we are now driving with them to explore another skiing area, which is considered the most diverse in the whole region. This skiing area is called Korvash, which struck me immediately for several reasons. Firstly, the views from the upper station of the Korvasht, at a height of 2 miles, are fantastic wallpapers depicting the Engadine Valley and the Lake Silverplanirse. On the other side is arguably the best view of the 2.5-mile Pitsburnina, the highest peaks of the Eastern Alps. 
Secondly, the skiing area itself, with a total area of the slopes a bit smaller than Corvelia, but besides the slopes, there's the world-famous Corvash Park. It's one of the largest in the Alps, and one of its main features is that it opens early in Europe after the summer season, for competitions or training, thanks to simple Swiss know-how. Yeah, it's like a big blanket, and uh, the warmth of the sun do doesn't affect under the blanket, so ah. it, it melts a little, but not much. So yeah, and, save a lot of snow. And in the winter they can build stuff like this in yeah. December, in November. Yeah. And the third reason is that it offers incredible conditions for free riding from the lift. The resort is mostly situated on the northern slope, contributing to better snow accumulation and preservation. The slopes are quite rocky, making them very interesting for those who like to hop a little from those same stones. Hey, are you stuck, free riders? <laughs> it's like an IQ test. If you couldn't pass this, then you shouldn't free ride. Woohoo! Yeah! Wow! Those stones! Kinda scary. Let's go. It's like a playground. Wow! Amazing, right? <laughs> and with delivery straight to the track, Swiss quality. And coming back to the upper station of Korvasht, I can't help but mention the beautiful panoramic restaurant located there. Its peculiarity is that they distill their own whiskey right here on the mountain, which they use in many of their signature dishes. I'm now a little regretting that I didn't taste anything back then and treated myself with just a coffee. And I think it's superfluous to mention the obvious, that both the restaurant and the observation deck at the station are simply sensational. Then, we were the last ones on the mountain to capture a few Instagram shots and to witness the entire Alpine range. Of course, the restaurant had already closed a long time ago, and we descended in the last gondola with employees who literally closed the place after us. I'm very thankful to them for letting us stay half an hour to take in this view of Korvasht. I have only pleasant memories from Korvasht and I definitely recommend it if you ever find yourself in this fine part of Switzerland. And I will leave Korvash by one of the coolest and most accessible ways, on the legendary Bernina Express. This famous railway route opened in 1910 to connect San Moritz and the Italian city of Tirano, and catching some important checkpoints on the way. For more details, let's walk as we're already departing.
A ticket cost me 37 francs, 32 for the train ticket, and an additional 5 for a seat in this wonderful panoramic coach. I decided not to buy online, but instead opt for the old school way. I went to the counter and asked the staff to select the best window seat, and I was handed this, a red envelope stuffed with tickets, some instructions, and best wishes for a safe journey. I just adore trains and try to use them whenever I can. And this was the best train experience I ever had. By the way, many say that they almost never check tickets in Europe, but in Switzerland, I encountered controllers on both trains. With this ticket, I immediately killed two birds with one stone, as it is an active public transportation route and one of the main attractions of the region. The Bernina Express, due to its engineering complexity and picturesque beauty, is included in the UNESCO Heritage List. And there are only four such railway routes in the world. The full path will begin a little further from San Moritz in the city of Chur, passing through 196 cities and 55 tunnels. The most famous section of the route is the Landwasser Viaduct, which many use to illustrate Switzerland. Unfortunately, I didn't pass through it, but Andrew kindly showed it to me when I was nearby on his bus. The Landwasser Viaduct, which many use to illustrate Switzerland. What I did pass through was the highest and most picturesque point of the route, the Bernina Pass. It is the highest pass in Europe through which the railway passes, observing the mountains, the valleys, and lakes around through these huge spherical windows. It's the quintessence of my travel experiences in Switzerland. Then, the train starts to descend from the highest elevation in Europe, from the Bernina Pass to the town of Brano. The descent of 1.11 miles is just a lot, and it's really, really picturesque. I spent a total of five days in Switzerland, and it was probably one of the most intense trips I've ever had. This fantastic, futuristic train that took me through the old Italian towns on my way to the airport was its culmination.